Welcome to Connect, the monthly series to connect you with your community. In each episode, we will speak with experts, innovators, and community members, and together explore themes of loneliness and social connection across Massachusetts. I'm your host, Sandra Harris, the State President for AARP Massachusetts and Co-Chair of the Task Force to End Loneliness and Build Community. With me today is Janet Seckel Serrati, Executive Director of Friendship Works. Welcome, Janet, and thank you so much for being with me today. It's wonderful to be here with you. Good. Janet, it's, uh, you do such great work in the community. Tell us the Friendship Works story. Sure. Well, I'll let you know that in 1984, Friendship Works started out as Match Up Interfaith Volunteers. And we, at that time, recognized that many older adults were aging in place without their family and friends around. And we were um, given a seed grant by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, to start this program called Match Up. And we were matching isolated older adults with volunteers of all ages. And we are now 38 years old um, this April and continuing to do that work. Our mission is to reduce social isolation, improve quality of life, and maintain the dignity of older adults in the greater Boston area. And our vision really is to end elder isolation, creating connections, because we believe that everybody should have a friend and have someone they can count on no matter who they are. Do you only serve the Boston community? The greater Boston community, well, some, some areas. So we serve all of Boston, wherever the mayor is the mayor, all of Brookline. We serve Newton, Somerville, and Cambridge. Oh, wonderful. So those are the areas that we serve. And um, we provide friendly visiting, medical escorts, a music program called Music Works, pet visitation oh, wow. to older adults living in assisted living and nursing homes. And we also do some friendly helping, which is tasks of life that those of us who are able-bodied take for granted. For the medical escorts, it's going with somebody um, to the medical appointment, staying with them when you're nervous, you're emotional, or physically need somebody to be with you, and um, stay with you and make sure that you get home safely. It's really an escort, not a transportation service. And the friendly visiting is about friendship. It's about making matches, and we take great care in getting to know the older adult who may have self-referred, or a family member did, or a medical doctor, or social work, or a neighbor has referred them, and then we recruit volunteers, people of all of ages 18 through 100 who might be the volunteer, oh, wow. 15 and older for medical, for our friendly helping. And we look at who they are. It is like a match, matchmaking service. We're now called Friendship Works for the last 12 years because we know friendship works. But it is looking at what are the interests of the older adult? Um, what, what background do they have? What would they like in a friend? What are they looking for? And for the volunteer, the same thing. And so does somebody really, it, does it matter to them if they're a male or a female? Does it matter to them like if they're, they love science and want to talk about science or the Red Sox, they can talk about that. We'll try and find somebody who lives not too far from them, who could visit on a regular basis. And during COVID, it was on the phone. Um, to really create a friendship. And the best part is that after a while, people stop calling themselves volunteers and recipients, and, and they become really close friends with one another. That's wonderful, Janet. You know, when we began to notice um, how this epidemic was impacting our communities, and we knew that we had to come together, bring a group of people together, to kind of begin to look at how do we address this as partners throughout the state. Yours was the first name that we heard, um, getting friendship work uh, involved. And, and as with some of the, all of the other organizations, you readily came to our table. Why was it so important for you to be a part of this, of this work? It's a wonderful question and one that I, I, I love that you're asking. Because um, in, in 2014, I think it was, we created a 10-year vision and a five-year plan. And we, we decided we had an obligation to grow because what we had learned how to do what we were doing well. And people were, instead of us knocking on doors, which you often do in your early years, people were knocking on our doors and saying, how do you do this? We like your model. And so we made a decision to double in size, which we did in, in that five-year period. But I wanted to do more. No matter what we do, there's only so many people we're going to be able to 
serve to be in the lives of as a program, as a nonprofit in, in um, the greater Boston area. But we want to have impact beyond that. And I think what we do isn't about us, it's about all of us. It's about society, it's about all of our neighborhoods, it's about the world. And people are, are finding themselves lonely and isolated, many, not everybody. And so if we could help be part of that turning point, that, that pivot in society and bring our experience of these 38 years to the table and then join with others, learn from others that together, I do believe the vision to end elder isolation and create connection for all can happen. Alone, we can do so much, but not more. But with you and with all the other organizations and individuals, I believe we can change the world. So from your perspective, um, how, how does this intergenerational model work? Is it working well? Do you see the difference that it's making in the work that you're doing? Absolutely. And our volunteers, as I said, are 18, for friendly visitor, 18 through, I think our oldest right now is 85 or 90. But often they're intergenerational. So sometimes even somebody who's 40 is, is two generations apart from somebody who's 80 or two and a half. But I know I can think of a match now where they're over 50 years apart. And um, many younger people are, are looking for a relationship with an older person. And many older people, are the many of the people we serve do not have as many relationships in the world as they would like and are looking for some and sometimes they want somebody of their own age but often they love the energy um, and the information that young people bring uh, we often talk about for people who can't get out we bring the world into them and i think it's so important that generations understand each other we really really need each other the older as I get older, and I've always loved older people, I'm feeling a need to have more relationships with, with younger people. And because there's, a, there's an understanding, understanding what the world is like from their point of view. It's engaging, it's stimulating. We can talk about the differences in our times. And that's what friendship is about, is about really sharing. So we're asking both the young and the old to share with one another, to gain perspective from one another, to understand the world from each other's uh, you can't walk in their shoes, but a little bit closer to that. And so um, it just broadens the world for each person to understand what's going on for the generation of the other person. And, and, and I think the key here is it's by, de by directional benefits, right? It's just not the older adult getting the benefit, right? We're seeing how young, um, young people are really benefited from being around older adults. Um, one of the things that we have done as a task force if cre has created the subcommittee uh, for intergenerational programming and activities. Tell us a little bit about what that committee is doing. Well, that committee is looking at college students and um, they're looking at, you know, how we can recruit more volunteers, you know, for the community, how it can be structured more easily within communities when somebody's looking for a relationship or organizations would like young people to volunteer with them. So um, for organizations or communities that do not have a friendship work, um, just not have an organization that's doing the work that you're doing in the Boston community and the um, surrounding areas. How can they get started with a program? What advice would you give, um, you know, stakeholders and town officials? How do they get something like friendship work started in their communities? I think for towns, they can find out about the work that the uh, that the coalition is is doing the and um, which I know that you know you are so so immersed in as as am I and that different towns can learn from from us and the gathering of different organizations towards this. They can find it about the community groups that are already involved in intergenerational work or just in aging work and in youth work and finding out if they can come together, finding out how schools can work within that. Families might do that and for individuals who are looking for something, you know, just. Um, thinking about who do you know in your world that really is of a different generation? And maybe you can reach out to them. Maybe it's a reason to reach out when we're so hesitant. Maybe you have a great niece or a nephew or if you're an older person say, I don't really know them that well. Maybe you can call them and find out and say, I'd like to interview you. If you're a younger person, maybe you'd like to interview you know, somebody of an older generation, your family or your neighborhood. Uh, maybe if you play, I was thinking for myself the other day as I am becoming one of, uh, of that age cohort that, and I don't have very young, I have, uh, 
people in my life who are in their 20s and 30s, but I don't have younger children in my life. I have a neighbor who's a young child who's learning how to play piano, <laughs> and I play a little piano. And I thought, maybe I could, once COVID feels really safe, I could say, you want to come over? We can play a duet together, things, a way to reach out. So you have to stop and think, who, who's in my sphere? How can I reach out to them? Knock on a door, um, say I'm really interested in you know, getting to know you, and not to be shy to do that, because it's such a gift to all of us when somebody reaches out. And if they don't want it, they can say no, and nothing is lost. Yep. You know, we hear the word intergenerational. And I'm beginning to feel that maybe we ought to use a different kind of word. Because for me, um, intergenerational means, you know, generally an older adult with a younger person, right? And um, that means oftentimes um, you've skipped a generation, right? So it doesn't really include it. So I'm beginning to use the word co-generational, right? Um, and, I, and I think that's important because for me, it takes that them against us, right? And, and really beginning to develop a narrative where and an understanding and a mindset that we're all in this together, right? And we all need to work together and help each other to solve this issue. So keeping that in mind and coming out of the pandemic, uh, where people, hopefully, we can kind of remove or move more to a new normal. Um, and you've obviously been in this business for a long time, doing this work with such passion and love. Um, what would you change today? What, would you, what, what is it that if you could change anything about the work that you're doing um, as we go forward into our new normal, what would that be? What would that look like? Well, first, I want to say I, I love the fact that, you know, you talk about co-generational. I, I, I use the word multi-generational because I think we all need each other. And you've seen this in actually in elephant societies when the elder um, matriarch or patriarch, whatever, dies, that ele the younger elephants go wild. They really need that. And, and I just think that, that, that there's a mentorship, there's a, there's a restraint, there's a behavior that we learn from one another. And so um, I do think generations need one another. And in terms of your wonderful question, I would love to see um, every community you know, in the world, you know, and certainly in Massachusetts or you know, in the country, have a program similar to, to Friendship Works. What we do so much is what we wish we didn't have to do, that people just knew their neighbors in a way that they didn't. But what we do is we really, we're matchmakers. So, you know, to learn to really find out who you are and what kind of connection you want. So no matter how old you are, even if you're unable to get out of your house, or how young you are in terms of, and I'm not, I, actually I'm not talking about young children, that's a different kind of intergenerational program than what we do, but uh, you're looking for a friend who really can mentor, who can listen to you, um, or if you're 40 or 50 years old and you want that kind of wisdom and you wanna be matched with somebody, that there's somebody who gets to know you and really helps you create a friend that nobody um, should be alone who doesn't want to be that everybody should be connected, that our communities um, should find ways to keep in touch with one another. And we have talked about replication or helping to do training around that, to do lifelong learning, um, that as long as we're alive, that we, and, you know, we um, have, have the ability to give, then I wanna make sure that people can give and find a purpose for waking up each morning. Great, great, great. You know, one of the first things that we did um, when we started the, the task force was we launched this Reach Out MA campaign where we encourage all Bay Staters to reach out in small, safe ways because of COVID uh, to their neighbors, especially to older adults who are living alone, to you know, make a telephone call to a friend or loved one that you've not talked with in a long time. Just reminding them of what it means to be a good neighbor. Uh, and I thought that was so important. It's just the little things that can be done that we really um, just don't think about and things that we don't remember to do, especially with loved ones and people that we care about and our neighbors, you know, send them a cup of coffee. So if we have someone who is uh, alone now, who's watching our program, what advice would you give them? And, you know, they're so inspired by the work that you do, as we all are. What, what would you recommend that they do? 
what's just a small thing that they could do to kind of step out of their comfort zone and walk out into their community and say hello? What, what would you tell them? I want them to own who they are. That it, So many times I, I've heard older older persons, and particularly women who may not have worked, uh, you know, had a professional career where most, m some of our older generation have not, like, what did you do? You organized a household, you know, you took care of other people, how your skills translate, what do you love? Do you love to plant? Like, think about the things you love that, that you have a passion for, and that may have changed over time, or something you want to learn, and see who in the community might need that. Own your strength. Um, there's something, everybody has something to offer, whether it is a listening ear, I really know how to listen and I can respond and I can listen well. Or I could teach somebody to knit and maybe, you know, I could, I could get together with some um, women to teach them to knit. I have a certain, um, you know, I, I, I traveled the world and I could tell people about my travels from 50 years ago and we can talk about how different it is today. So to think about the things you want to bring um, that would be rich for you, the kind of relationship you want and then Take a, little, take a little time or ask a neighbor, what's around, what, let me learn a little bit more about my own neighborhood, who might be able to use their skills. Now, we will turn it over to our field reporter, Cassley Killian, who spoke with participants who were matched with a new friend through Friendship Work. So today we are joined by Peter McIntyre and Grace Yu, who are active in the Friendly Visiting Program that Janet just shared with us. So thank you so much, Peter and Grace, for joining us today. It's great to have you. <laughs> Thanks for inviting us. It's great to be here. So I would love to start off by learning from each of you what inspired and motivated you to get involved with Friendship Works in the first place. And Peter, maybe we could start with you. Okay. Um, a friend of mine um, at church, a fellow deacon, uh, Sue Edwards, uh, told me that when she had retired from business in Chicago at the age of 65, she had moved east to be closer to her relatives and then had taken up a, a whole new career of doing volunteer work, which included being one of the co-founders of uh, Interfaith Matchup which has morphed into uh, friendship works over, over the years. And um, so years later, um, I realized that I, I really needed to get out and walk and get some, uh, some uh, uh, exercise. So I tracked down friendship works and uh, then Samantha, who at that time was the, the coordinator for the Brighton Austin office, uh, introduced Grace and me in my living room. And uh, that was on the, uh, I think it was on the 5th of June of 2015. So Grace and I are coming up in a couple of months on our seventh anniversary of this wonderful friendship. That's fantastic. And Grace, what about you? What inspired you to, to join this program? So um, my reasoning for joining Friendship Works is actually, um, a little interesting. So I'm not from around here. I'm actually from Southern California. Um, and I moved here after um, getting a job here. And I don't have friends in the area. When I first moved here, I had two friends who helped me move here. And that was about it. And not only that, but I'm not particularly connected with family. So I know how lonely it is to be without people. Um, and I remember when I first got here, I would go to the tea every morning and I'd pick up an improper Bostonian magazine when they were running issues. Um, and I flipped it back just to see like, okay, what can I do around here? Um, and one of the volunteer options on there was Friendship Works. And I was like, this sounds interesting. So I looked into it and I got con uh, connected. Um, and they directed me to Samantha, as Peter mentioned, who was the coordinator for Brighton at the time. And I lived in Brighton at the time, which was very convenient. <laughs> um, and she matched us up with Peter. And as I learned more about the program, the more I was into actually participating, because I know how hard it is to be alone in the world. And for me, it's like, well, if I can help somebody while, you know, sort of helping my own personal loneliness, like all the better, it's a win-win situation. So it's nice that um, Peter and I matched up. Uh, we're very similar in the way we interact with each other. And also um, 
for me personally, I've always wanted to have like a grandparent kind of figure. So I jokingly actually adopted Peter as my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, I love hearing a little bit about how your friendship blossomed. Could you tell us more about how the friendship has evolved and kind of what your experience has been like since you first met in 2015? Grace, would you like to lead off? Sure. Um, so I would say it's definitely evolved over the years. At first, we would meet on a very regular schedule as if it was like a program we were participating in, right? Um, but as life threw its hurdles and things came up and, you know, COVID happened, <laughs> um, we sort of adapted to each other's personal schedules and our life circumstances at the time, as well as um, the way we interact, I think, I don't know if Peter's noticed this, but I've shared a lot more personal life stories, the way I think about things, the way I approach things over the years, um, as opposed to when we first started off, it was a little like meeting a new person. <laughs> Just you only share this little tiny information, but now it's a lot more like family, I would say. Interesting. That's evolved similar to how any friendship does, kind of ebbs and flows and you get closer over time. That's really neat. Peter, what about from your perspective? That's right. Um, uh, Grace and I have a lot of interest in, in common. Uh, both of us loved the Latin language in high school. Yeah. So, and it turned out uh, Grace also loved Latin, but we also loved English and museums and went to various museums and, and had wonderful times together. She brought uh, some of her friends along. We explored the, the funny little uh, roads behind my apartment building, and we went to the the glass flowers exhibit at Harvard's uh, Museum of Natural History, where Grace is a docent, uh, and she's a she's also a botanist. So she was able to explain uh, how uh, these different flowers uh, work and how predators uh, interact with them. So it's the one thing after another is opened up uh, to a, a, a different area of life in which we can share our experience and um, also a, a, our curiosity. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I, I love to hear that. Um, wow, it's so interesting to, to hear about how your friendship has evolved and also the fact that it sounds like, you know, I think some people might think that programs like Friendship Works program might be designed to help one end of the age spectrum, but it really sounds like what I'm hearing is that there's value to both of you and coming from different generations, you're both getting different things out of this, this connection that you have and, and out of the program. Grace, maybe you could speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, so um, I think the way I see it from the general perspective of being here in Boston as a transplant, <laughs> um, is that I've noticed in Boston, there's a lot of movement of people. There's people who move in, come here for a couple of years, move out. For some people, it's a 10 year span. For other people, it's like a two or three year span even. Um, and so it's actually interesting that with Peter and I's relationship, we have this bond for so many years. And because of the um, situation that we are in, personally we've been able to keep this friendship up in a longer term um, and it's nice to have that sense of stability just between our friendship um, and not have to be like okay well i'm moving out of city bye because <laughs> we're friends you know if we really wanted to we can maintain this connection however we want and um peter <laughs> computer could probably tell you the whole story about it but we've been learning technology <laughs> a little bit so that we can better use our technology, um, even a little bit before COVID to interact and build more friendships outside. Um, and Peter could probably also tell you the other side of the intergenerational where Friendship Works has a program where they pair them up with um, little kids. And so he used to go and read with the little kids all the time. And he'd tell me stories and I hear stories from the Friendship Works side about how great he is, how everyone loves him. <laughs> I'm not surprised to hear that. <laughs> yeah, that was a, um, a a wonderful program. I hope that after the panic is over, we can re re uh, reboot it. Um, 
this was a combination of friendship works and the presentation school foundation, which took an old school in, in Oak Square in Brighton and uh, turned it into a community center. And so we would get together for five Saturdays for 90 minutes um, with uh, kids from the first, second and third grades. Their parents would drop them off and then pick them up afterwards. And we'd start off by having the head teacher uh, who had played different roles in, in the public school system, uh, read from a book, for example, Ferdinand the Bull, which was written and, and published in 1936, about this, this big muscular bull who didn't want to get all sweaty in the, the corrida and, and get stuck with swords and stuff. He just wanted to smell the flowers. And, and so um, afterwards, after we had read about him and his adventures, uh, we moved over to the table and the kids would write in their notebooks uh, one sentence with a, a predicate, a, a subject and a predicate, uh, a complete grammatical sentence. And sometimes the kids would write a paragraph, it was wonderful. Uh, then we would move on to arts and crafts. And uh, for example, with flowers, uh, we would do, this is my great work of art, which will go down through the ages. Creativity will run no rampant. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to, to both of you for illuminating and, and giving us a true example of, of why intergenerational friendship matters. Like you said, Peter, there are all those different layers of that Grand Canyon. And, and I love that analogy. I think there's so much value from all of us connecting from young all the way up to old um, across our lifespan. So thank you both very much. I wish we could talk for hours more, but thank you so much for giving this, this glimpse into your friendship and into the value of programs like Friendship Works. And with that, Sandra, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Castley. It is great to hear the stories of community members who have experienced the joy of intergenerational connections firsthand. Janet, do you have any final thoughts for our audience? Well, one thing I think we didn't talk about, there were probably many things and we could talk for hours and I can tell so many stories, which I didn't have a chance to, but is um, I want to I point out that what we do is in Spanish and English, although we will also match anybody of any language and find somebody who speaks their language. We will go out and do that. We've had, we've matched people who love chess with somebody who loves chess, but also somebody, no matter what their gender identity is or if, uh, or if they have vision loss, um, you know, we are, we will find the right person. We will find the right friend. We will try and be a catalyst um, for a new friendship for people, both on the volunteer side as well as on the hostess or participant side. Um, and I believe that there's a match for everybody. And I also believe that you're never too old to have a new friend, and you're never too young to have an old friend. I think I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Janet, thank you so much for being with me today. And um, your work in our community and at Friendship Work is legendary. So thank you so much for your doing for our community and all that you bring to the task force. We thank you also, our views, for being with us. We look forward to continuing this conversation on how you can connect and build community in your neighborhood. Tune in next month to learn about the digital divide and ways that you can become tech savvy at any age. Until then, please visit us at inlonelinessma.com to learn more about the task force and how you can get involved. Thank you.